Hi, my name is Patricia Piluf Silveira, and I work at the Department of Psychiatry at McGill, being affiliated to the Ludmer Center for Neuroinformatics and Mental Health and the Douglas Research Center. I would like to thank you for the invitation to be here and share my work with you. Classical genome-wide association studies largely contributed for our understanding of many human conditions. But they are basically case control studies. You genotype a large group of individuals with the condition or phenotype of interest and a large number of people without that phenotype. You run somewhat simple statistical analysis and come up with a list of SNPs that are more represented in the group of patients versus controls. GWASs define the genetic background associated with a condition or trait. However, we know that GWASs so far explain only a fraction of the variance associated with the phenotype. But genes code for biological processes, not for disease. Gene expression is tightly regulated by a series of events, from the gene code to epigenetic processes, and these are highly responsive to environmental changes. Gene expression is also highly tissue-specific, and changes in gene expression in the different tissues will define the phenotypes linked to diseases. So our lab decided to combine this consideration of the biological aspects involved in the development of a certain phenotype or disease to the GWAS technology and propose a different way of prioritizing SNPs to include in a predictive polygenic score. And that's the topic of my talk today. This is the summary of my presentation. I'm going to give you an overview of the main focus of my lab, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Then I'll walk you through the rationale that led my lab to develop the biologically informed polygenic scores in the context of our research line. And finally, I'll show you a recent study from my lab that uses the EPRS that is now available for calculation on your own sample in the Canadian Open Neuroscience platform. And that will be the focus of the tutorial this afternoon. My lab spent quite a bit of time investigating the effects of being born small for gestational age on child behavior and risk for disease later in life. In a series of studies in human samples and animal models, we show that intrauterine growth restriction is linked to increased preference and impulsivity towards palatable foods such as sugars and fats at different ages during the life course. This altered behavioral phenotype is associated with differences in the neural responses to palatable food images in our neuroimaging studies, with increased activation of areas related to impulse control. We believe that these effects and the subtle differences in eating behavior and impulsivity throughout the life course contribute to their well-known increased risk for metabolic disease and psychopathology later in life, such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, ADHD, and depression. One possible mechanism that can explain these differences is insulin function. We know that insulin is that hormone produced by the pancreas, 
and involved in the use of glucose by the cells in the periphery. But we also know that insulin enters the brain and influences behavior. Acting on its receptors distributed throughout the brain, insulin modulates neurotransmission in different ways, affecting behaviors such as sensitivity to reward, cognition, and impulsivity. We also know that children born small for gestational age have altered insulin function from birth. Fetal growth restriction is linked to impaired pancreas development, leading to poor insulin secretion and hence altered sensitivity in different tissues during the life course. Our lab has shown, for instance, that catch-up growth, an insulin-dependent process in children born SGA, is associated with impulsivity in preschoolers. So understanding brain insulin function in this population seems to be critical for appraising the differences that we see in impulsivity at the behavioral level. Based on that, we can design a framework in which early life adversity reflected in poor fetal growth leads to an altered behavioral phenotype of increased preference and impulsivity towards palatable foods, altered sensitivity to reward and cognition. Using animal models, my lab has described that alteration in dopaminergic neurotransmission in different regions of the mesocortical limbic system of the brain, like the nucleus accumbens and prefrontal cortex, is the mechanism that explains this behavioral phenotype. Moreover, we also show that at the neurochemical level, there is a differential modulation of dopaminergic signaling by insulin in fetal growth restricted individuals. And restoring insulin function in the brain completely reverts the behavioral phenotype in rodents. Now, as much as the animal models help us understand these mechanisms, one question that remains is how much does biological processes are relevant or even happening in humans? How can we study variations in insulin function, specifically in the brain, in clinical studies, let's say in children cohorts, and associate these variations with the behavioral phenotype? So my lab has been using functional genomics to face these challenges. We know that genes are inherited from our parents and they don't change during the life course. However, there exist small variations in the sequence called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs that are responsible for the differences in our phenotype, like our eye color. This variation that we see at the phenotype level in fact reflects variation in biological function at the molecular level. We all remember that the sequence of our genetic code in our DNA is the template used during gene expression to guide the cellular processes leading to protein synthesis and therefore controlling the cell machinery. From gene expression up to the actual function of a protein or enzyme, there are many levels of regulation or epigenetic processes. But in fact, the template is the gene. So in a large human population, small variations in genotype will be linked to subtle variations in certain biological processes. However, the genome-wide technology has been used so far with a high focus on disease state rather than on the biological process leading to that disease. This is the image that represents a GWAS. In the x-axis, 
you see the different chromosomes. All the bullets represent genetic variants or SNPs. And in the y-axis, you see the statistical association between the presence of that variant and a specific disease condition or trait. The higher the bullet is on the plot, the more significant it is in the GWAS, and therefore more associated with the disease. However, each variant in isolation represents only a small fraction of the variance of a trait. In an attempt to improve prediction capacity, researchers started summing up the SNPs identified in the GWAS in polygenic scores. So instead of looking at the predictive capacity of one single SNP, we started summing up the small effects of many variants at a certain p-value threshold of the GWAS and creating a polygenic predictor, like the one you see here in the rectangle. A polygenic risk score can then be calculated for each subject in uh, the sample as the sum of the risk alleles count weighted by the effect size described in a GWAS. Although this technique is very useful as a summary of the genetic information, note that the selection of SNPs is based exclusively in mathematics the significance level of the GWAS for that disease, having no biological information attached to it. But remember, genes code for biological processes, not for disease. That's the main driver for our lab to come up with a novel technique that prioritizes SNPs based on their biological function to be included in a predictive polygenic score. We call this technique the biologically informed expression-based polygenic score or EPRS. We are guided by the principle of gene networks that considers that gene expression is co-regulated by other genes and consequently genes involved in the same network are expected to have similar expression profiles. In other words, genes expressed together work together in the same biological process. This is the bioinformatic process leading to the calculation of the EPRS. Basically, what we do is to use genome-wide gene expression data, RNA sequencing data, from rodents or post-mortem human tissue in the specific brain region that you want to target and identify the genes that are highly co-expressed with your gene of interest. Provided our focus on insulin action in modulating dopaminergic neurotransmission, we were interested in the genes that are co-expressed with the insulin receptor in the brain as a cortical limbic system. And in this case, we started from mice tissue. We then find human orthologs for these genes. We can use data from animal models to obtain the brain region specificity that we want, and also filter the gene list by those more expressed in a specific period of life during development if we want. This is very important for me as my lab is focused on early life adversity effects. So we want our gene network to represent genes that are highly expressed early in life. So we often use BrainSpan, that is an atlas of the developing human brain transcriptomics for this step. When we get to the final list of genes, we map all the SNPs that exist on these genes and filter this list by eliminating those SNPs in liquid, linkage disequilibrium. And finally, we use a GWAS, usually a gene expression GWAS, like GTEX, 
to weigh the SNPs and calculate the score. In the tutorial later today, I'll go into the nitty gritty details of each step of this figure. So the score in this case summarized the information from 281 genes of the mesocorticolimbic insulin receptor gene network in a single variable. Now, what does this variable or this score mean? Well, if I map the SNPs selected to be included in the score in a regular GWAS, in this case, ADHD GWAS, we see that our SNPs are not significant in the GWAS. And in fact, I don't care because the signal that I want to capture is not whatever passes a certain statistical threshold but the one associated with the specific biological process that I'm trying to represent in the score. Remember that our aim here is to select variants that represent variations in the expression of this gene network, not necessarily those that are significant in the GWAS. If I use a software to visualize the gene network that is comprised by the score, that's what you see. The connections represent protein-protein interactions. So these molecules are working together in the network. Now, as a comparison, if I take the same number of the most significant SNPs from the ADHD GWAS and map them into genes, that's what we see not much of a network. There is exactly the same number of genes in all figures here, but those that are not connected are not shown. And finally, if we take the same number of a random group of SNPs, map them into genes and create the network, there's absolutely no network formed. So these figures shows that if we quantify the number of connections of the network, our EPRS represents a much more cohesive gene network than the other two examples. Now, let's say that I convinced you that we formed the gene network and that it is represented in our score. What does this mean? Can the score predict phenotypes that are associated with the function of the insulin receptor in the mesocorticolimbic system? To test that, we use the task called the information sampling task from the Cantab battery applied at 72 months in our Canadian bird cohort called MAVEN. In this task, we are measuring reflection impulsivity and decision-making through a computerized interface. Children are presented with a five by five matrix of gray boxes on the computer screen and two larger colored panels at the foot of the screen. We tell the children, you can open as many boxes as you want and then tell me which color is in majority. So some children open one by one of the boxes, count them, and then decide. Other kids will open only three or four and then decide. And that's exactly what we're measuring, the amount of information that they sample before making a decision. Our EPRS from the mesocorticolimbic insulin receptor is shown in the x-axis in the figure and the impulsivity levels in the y-axis. The lower the y-axis score, the more impulsive is the child, the less information the child samples before making a decision. So we see that as the EPRS decreases, there is more impulsivity in boys, but not girls at this age. We validated the findings by comparing the ability of other classic polygenic scores to predict the same effect. And this analysis shows that our EPRS 
was superior than classical polygenic scores for addiction, ADHD, and a random group of SNPs in predicting the interaction at the behavioral uh, level or the phenotype of impulsivity. We also wanted to see if impulsivity in childhood could be linked to the presence of adult psychopathology. As impulsivity is highly linked to addiction, we wanted to see if our score could predict the presence of addiction in adults. For that, we used data from a large study of more than 2,500 participants that had information on genotype as well as addiction in adulthood. We are able to replicate the same findings seen before in which the lower the score, the higher the number of addiction comorbidities or how many substance the person was addicted to in men, but not women. And this was also seen if we looked at the probability for alcohol dependence specifically. To summarize, the expression-based brain region specific EPRS for the insulin receptor represents a developmentally relevant gene network with enrichment for specific processes like neurogenesis, chromatin modification, and translation processes. Variations in this score predict particular endophenotypes in childhood like impulsivity, and this behavior maps onto risk for psychopathologies like addiction later in life. Psychopathology related to poor inhibitory control or decision-making encompasses a wide range of conditions, ADHD, addiction, eating disorders, gambling, suicide. The neurobiological understanding of these conditions contributes to the development of tools for early identification and primary prevention. Importantly, we also created the EPRS uh, for the insulin receptor based on the gene network of this receptor in the hippocampus. That is a brain region in which there is an abundance of insulin receptor gene expression. And the function of insulin in this brain region has been associated with the development of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. We saw that these two gene networks are very different, proving that the EPRS is indeed brain region specific. As expected, we observed that variation in the hippocampal score is related to variation in cognitive abilities in children, both boys and girls in this case, but not to impulsivity. Similarly, the mesocortical limbus score does not predict cognition, confirming the brain's brain specificity also at the level of the behavioral phenotype prediction. Finally, we used a large data set of more than 3,500 Alzheimer patients and controls, and our hippocampal EPRS score did pretty well in predicting the presence of Alzheimer in cases. So this technology allows us to move away from studies investigating gene by environment interaction to gene network by environment interaction, which is much more interesting and informative from a mechanistic point of view and much more plausible in biological terms, especially if you consider the brain region specificity feature of the EPRS. As an example of this type of investigation, I'll show you a recent study from my lab. In this case, as a proof of concept, we wanted to use a very well-known biological mechanism linked to the long-term effects of early life adversity on psychopathology. Alterations in the brain serotonin transporter function as the basis of our EPRS calculation. 
we focus, focus this study on the amygdala, which is the brain region most likely involved in these associations. ADHD is the most common psychopathology in infancy, strongly linked to early life adversity exposure. Alterations in serotonin synthesis, breakdown, and transport have been also associated to ADHD-related phenotypes. The synthesis of serotonin occurs in serotonergic neurons where serotonin is stored into presynaptic vesicles by a vesicular monoamine transporter. After being released, serotonin is recycled through a process of active reuptake by the serotonin transporter. The serotonin transporter represents a primary mechanism for regulation of serotonergic activity and is expressed in brain regions implicated in attention and memory, such as the amygdala, hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is predominantly modulated by the serotonergic system and plays an important role in attentional processes. Genetic variation in, serotonin, in the serotonin transporter gene also associates with individual differences in DNA methylation, a functional epigenetic modification of the DNA, as well as serotonin transported gene expression. Interestingly, it has been shown that the genetic effects on DNA methylation emerge as a function of the exposure to adversity early in life, highlighting the importance of the interplay between the genome and the environment in the regulation of the serotonin transporter gene expression. So based on this evidence, we hypothesize that individual differences in the expression of the serotonin transporter gene network in the amygdala moderates the effect of uh, early life adversity on attention-related problems in childhood. To test that, we constructed an expression-based polygenic risk score, or EPRS, that reflects the function of the amygdala serotonin transporter gene network and described how this polygenic predictor interacted with po postnatal adversity that is represented in our study by a cumulative adversity score that we calculated considering variables such as socioeconomic status, maternal depression, childhood hospitalization, and other types of adversity during childhood. So we looked at the interaction between these two factors in the prediction of attention disorders and brain gray matter density in childhood. We also investigated the association between postnatal adversity and the EPRS for the serotonin transporter gene network, as well as their interaction on variations in the DNA methylation across the genome. The EPRS was created for amygdala, considering genes co-expressed with the serotonin transporter specifically in this brain region. We used amygdala RNA sequencing data from mice that is available on the gene network portal. But in fact, you can use any sort of RNA sequencing data to generate a list of genes co-expressed with your gene of interest. In this case, the serotonin transporter gene. These genes were filtered using BrainSpan to identify consensus transcripts enriched for genes overexpressed in childhood, as I mentioned before. We then selected all SNPs from these genes, clumped the SNP list, and weighted the SNPs by the slope of the association between the number of effect alleles at that SNP and gene expression making use of the amygdala gene expression GWAS 
available in GTEx. By summing all the values across the different SNPs, we calculate the amygdala serotonin transporter EPRS for each individual in our cohort. As an outcome, we use the different domains related to ADHD problems, attention problems, externalizing problems from the child behavior checklist in these two samples of children, the Canadian Maven cohort at four and five years of age and the Singaporean Gusto cohort at five years of age. In Maven children, we found a significant interaction effect between the adversity score and the amygdala-based EPRS for the serotonin transporter on domains of the CBCL related to attentional problems. In all the plots here, the x-axis represents the adversity score and the y-axis represents the attention and ADHD problems outcomes. We observed uh, an increase on ADHD attention and externalizing problems as adversity exposure increases, especially for children with a lower serotonin transporter EPRF score. These findings were replicated in the Singaporean cohort GASTO. And importantly, we identified evidence of differential susceptibility in several of our interactions, which means that the profile of individuals whose behavior is negatively affected by environmental adversity is also the one that benefits the most from more supportive settings. This is especially important because it means that our genetic score is in fact representing environmental responsivity and plasticity rather than being determinant in the development of these conditions. So we demonstrated that the expression-based polygenic score reflecting variations in the function of the amygdala serotonin transporter gene network interacts with postnatal adversity exposure influencing attention and hyperactivity problems in different cohorts and different ages. Further, we aimed at verifying if epigenetic processes could be involved in this finding. And we had uh, DNA methylation data available for MAVEN children. So in our data, we identified more than 50,000 variably methylated probes across the genome. And we compared for each probe, the prediction of DNA methylation by the postnatal adversity alone, the EPRS alone, or adversity by EPRS interaction. We observed that the postnatal adversity explained DNA methylation levels in 47% of the cases. The EPRS for the serotonin transported main effect was associated with DNA methylation in 43% uh, of the sites. And the interaction between the two factors explained variation in 10% of the CPGs which is a considerable proportion. And this is aligned with the uh, understanding of our gene network. Here is the visualization of the amygdala serotonin transporter gene network. And it's very interesting to note that the hub genes are the most central genes in terms of connections of this network also are genes especially involved in epigenetic processes. We then use data from BrainSpan that comprises transcriptomics in human postmortem tissue, as I mentioned before, to correlate the expression levels of the genes included in the amygdala serotonin transported EPRS in childhood and adulthood. 
we observe large clusters of highly co-expressed genes in both periods in red in the two figures. However, different gene clusters are seen if you compare the two images, suggesting that there is a developmental influence on the design of the clusters of co-expression of these genes in humans. So the gene network configuration changes during development. And in order to perform an anatomical functional correlation of our findings, we analyzed the relationship between brain gray matter density and the SNPs used to create the EPRS for the serotonin transporter gene in 49 children from MAVEN that had MRI data and genotype data available. We use this multivariate analysis called the parallel ICA that identified seven significant pairs of correlation between voxel gray matter volume and the SNPs from the EPRS. The most significant association between gray matter density and the SNP-based EPRS data was on the genetic component 12 and MRI component 5. And what's nice about this technique is that we can then open up these two components, the genetic and the imaging component, to identify which specific portions of the gene network are acting in which specific brain regions to define these associations. So the SNPs in the amytal serotonin transporter gene network are associated with gray matter density in cortical areas involved in memory, attention, information processing, and decision-making, such as the precunius, the superior and inferior temporal gyrus, the frontal gyrus, and inferior parietal lobe. But this association is not moderated by the early life adversity in this subsample of kids. And in the genetic component associated with these attention-related brain regions, we found 14 significant SNPs. In the enrichment analysis by Metacore of these SNPs demonstrated that they are involved especially in regulation of neuronal migration, cerebral cortex development, neurogenesis, regulation of cell migration and cell development, which is quite interesting in the context of our gene network by environment interaction seen at the behavioral level. In conclusion, our findings provide support for the impact of the exposure to postnatal adversity on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and externalizing problems, showing that the serotonin transporter gene network is an important moderator of these effects. Our data also supports the hypothesis that this gene network has important impact in brain regions related with attention and cognitive processes. Additionally, the serotonin transporter gene network and the postnatal adversity are associated with variation in DNA methylation, which may explain the mechanism of the long-term effects of postnatal adversity. Our study extends the knowledge of how exposure to postnatal adversity affects behavior and highlights the importance of analyzing not just a candidate gene in psychiatry disorders, but an entire gene network. The amygdala serotonin transporter gene network EPRS calculation tool is now available at COMP, and this afternoon we will have a tutorial session on how to access and use it on our own sample. So you will be able to calculate the EPRS for this specific gene network on your own data. Now, as I simplified here, with the EPRS, we can investigate several other complex models of gene network by environment interaction in human samples. 
In these models, the EPRS represents the gene network or the biological processes that will respond to early environmental adversity. We can refine our investigations by querying the molecular mechanisms linked to responsivity to environmental insults. Understanding of gene network by environment interactions can help decipher the developmental origins of adult disease and establish preventive and therapeutic measures. Since we published the first paper on this technique, there has been an amazing interest and an incredible number of requests for collaborations to generate and calculate the EPRS. So we will be regularly offering workshops to support the development of these projects. The first workshop is gonna happen in January and here's the link for registering if you're interested. And that concludes my presentation. I would like to thank my students that in fact do all the work uh, even in, during these difficult times that we are facing, and also to my staff working remotely, but very close to each other, my collaborators, the funding sources, and especially you for your kind attention. Thank you.